talking for the very first time about specific structures within cells. And we are going to start with perhaps what we could equalize to be the heart of the cell, the nucleus. The nucleus can be seen as a cellular organelle that is defined by an envelope. So there are two layers to that envelope. There is the so-called inner nuclear membrane and the outer nuclear membrane. Inner nuclear membrane, shown here in the figure by I and M, and outer nuclear membrane, shown here by O and M. Now, next, we have the nuclear pore complex, or NPC. The NPC forms kind of a plug that closes the space that communicates the cytoplasm with the nucleoplasm. Now, notice how the inner nuclear membrane and the outer nuclear membrane are continuous. That is, the two membranes actually touch each other. They are not separate membranes. In reality, they are components of the same membrane. However, they only touch each other at the level of the nuclear pore complex. So, nuclear pore complexes are located right at the places where the outer nuclear membrane meets the inner nuclear membrane. One extra important feature of the membranes that form the nucleus is the fact that the outer nuclear membrane is continuous with the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum, shown in this figure by the ER. Right under the nuclear envelope, we have a support structure that is formed by small fibrillar structures, the so-called nuclear lamina. Attached to the outer nuclear membrane, as well as to attach to the membranes of the ER, we actually find a large number of ribosomes. And this indicates that attached to the nuclear membrane, you can actually have protein synthesis. Remember, ribosomes are places of protein synthesis. Okay, so that view that we had was a very two-dimensional view of what the nucleus is all about. But it's always better to think of things as three-dimensional structures, because that's what they truly are. So in this image, we have now a 3D reconstruction of the nucleus, and this is what the nucleus actually looks like. So you can actually see the membranes, and you can see the outer nuclear membrane and the inner nuclear membrane here, and you can actually find those pointed out in the image. But you can also see the nuclear pore complexes, and the places where the outer nuclear membrane meets the inner nuclear membrane, that's where the nuclear pore complexes are located. And here you can actually see more clearly um, the nuclear lamina. So the nuclear lamina is right underneath the inner nuclear membrane, and it's indicated in the lower part of the figure, nuclear lamina. Now, in the middle of the nucleus, as you would expect, what you find is the chromatin. So that's where the DNA is located. And you also see, you can also see how the outer nuclear membrane forms a continuous with the rough and the plasmic reticulum. And this gives you a better sense of the three-dimensional structure of the nucleus, as well as of the cell as a whole. Okay, so let's go back to our two-dimensional model of the nuclear envelope. Here you can clearly see the cytoplasm, the membranes of the ER, how they, fo they form a continuous with the outer and inner nuclear membrane. And here we have one extra component that is very important for you to pay attention to. And that is proteins that are located exclusively associated to the inner nuclear membrane. The names of those proteins are emerine and lamin B receptor. So those are two proteins that are specific of the inner nuclear membrane. So this is important. Even though the inner nuclear membrane forms a continuous with the outer nuclear membrane, there are proteins that are specifically localized only to the inner nuclear membrane. What is important about these two proteins is that they associate with the nuclear lamina. Therefore, they provide bridges, connecting points, that provide for this support structure to be tightly associated with the inner nuclear membrane. All right, so let's keep going. How do we know that these structures are actually forming that kind of shapes? Well, the reason for a lot of the knowledge that we have about these structures is based on images that had been done, had been obtained by doing electron microscopy. 
So this is one example of that kind of images. This is an electron microscopy image of the way the nuclear envelope looks like. And you can clearly see here how the outer nuclear membrane forms a continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. Now notice also how we actually see the nuclear pore complex in cross section. It actually looks like a dense region that has projections that are facing both the cytosol as well as the nucleoplasm. Now notice the level of the language. How I refer to cytosol is equivalent to cytoplasm. Nucleosol is the same as nucleoplasm. All right, so in summary, the structure of the nucleus shows that the nucleus contains a nuclear envelope that defines the boundaries of the nucleus. That envelope also acts as a barrier that prevents the free passage of molecules between the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and is equivalent from the functional point of view. The outer side of the, of the nuclear envelope is equivalent functionally to the rough and plasmic reticulum because it contains ribosomes that are associated to it. Now, in addition to that, the perinuclear space, that is the space that is contained within the outer nuclear membrane and the inner nuclear membrane, is also continuous with the lumen, that is the, the, the space of the endoplasmic reticulum. And therefore, that perinuclear space is functionally equivalent to the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So any metabolic activity that is associated with the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum will also be found in the perinuclear space. Now, finally, it's important to re-emphasize that the inner nuclear membrane exhibits proteins that are unique and specific to the inner nuclear membrane. And two examples of those proteins are emerine and lamin B receptor. Okay, so moving along, that was the nuclear envelope. Now we're going to be talking about the nuclear lamina. And when you think of that structure, I already defined it as a supporting structure for the nuclear envelope. This is the way it actually looks like. The nuclear lamina is a mesh. It's a mesh of filaments, proteins that form a mesh that provides physical support to the nuclear envelope. Now, those proteins that form that mesh are actually called lamines. And there are four different lamines, lamine A, lamine B, B1, B2, and lamine C. So four different lamine proteins that actually form dimers. They form homolimers. And in those homolimers, the heads are right next to the heads and the tails are right next to the tails. So two heads are right next to each other, two tails are right next to each other. But each one of those dimers has then the ability to interact with another dimer. And those interactions with other dimers are head to tail interactions. So basically you have dimers of lamin, the heads interacting with the tails, the tails interacting with the heads of other dimers. And therefore this allows these proteins to form very long chains that are formed by dimers. Now these long chains are physically very stable. So they actually provide support for the nucleus because of that stability. So they form fibrous structures that you can think of them as being almost equivalent of bones. They provide shape, they provide support to the nucleus. And they provide that shape and support by forming the polymers that are shown at the bottom of the, of the slide. So they form those higher order structures that provide a fibrillar structure that was shown in this particular slide. So that mesh is formed by this type of monomers. Okay, so moving along, the nuclear lamina then provides structural support to the nucleus. So it acts as a scaffolding structure for the nucleus. It is made of fibrous proteins that are related to intermediate filaments of the cytoskeleton. And those proteins are known as lamines. There are four different lamines, lamin A, lamin B1, lamin B2, and lamin C. And lamines for dimers that in turn long, form long fibers via head-to-tail interactions. Now, something very important is that those interactions between the heads and the tails can be disrupted by phosphorylation. So if you phosphorylate the lamines, the head-to-tail interactions will be disrupted. And if you disrupt those interactions, the whole supporting structure for the nucleus falls off. 
Now, the lamins are also post-translationally modified by the addition of lipids, specifically by farnesylation. Now, the lamins also have the ability to interact with the two proteins that we mentioned before, amyrin and lamin B receptor. And through those interactions, they provide a very sturdy, very, very um, well-organized support to the nuclear envelope. Okay, the next component that we need to talk about in terms of the structure of the nucleus is the nuclear pore complex. And the nuclear pore complex is basically the gate, the gate that communicates the cytoplasm with the nucleoplasm. So any molecule that is going to go from the nucleoplasm to the cytoplasm has to go through that gate. Okay, and this is how nuclear pore complexes look like on the envelope of the nucleus. So this is a cryofracture image captured by electron microscopy of the nuclear envelope. And those little circles that you see there that are indicated by the arrows, those are nuclear pore complexes. So you can clearly see how they form kind of little holes in the nuclear envelope. Now, this is a close-up view of those nuclear pore complexes. And as you can clearly see, each nuclear pore complex, so this is a bunch of them that have been purified, each one of those nuclear pore complexes is formed by eight different copies of the same structure. You can clearly see in the image that those nuclear pore complexes have radial symmetry, meaning they are symmetrical, and they are symmetrical in a circular way. And in fact, the whole thing is made of eight copies of the same structure. You can actually count them there. You can see clearly how there are eight little components in each one of those circles. Okay, now looking in cross-section to the nucleus, you can clearly see how the nuclear pore complex is actually right in the place where the inner nuclear membrane is meeting the outer nuclear membrane, just as we had mentioned before. Okay, so moving along, this is a good way of representing the structure of the nuclear pore complex. So this is a drawing that I actually chose um, in a very systematic way, what we know about the structure of the nuclear pore complex. So the first thing that you can actually see here it is that it is a symmetrical structure, but it is only partially symmetrical. So there are like three main rings in the nuclear pore complex. There is one that is facing the cytoplasm, there is one that is right in the middle, and then there is one ring that is right toward the nucleoplasm. Now, those rings are symmetrical, but on top of the of the cytoplasmic ring, there are structures that we refer to as cytoplasmic filaments. So they are kind of long arms that are projecting into the cytoplasm. On the other end of the nuclear pore complex, you have other extensions that look like a basket. And those projections are projecting into the nucleoplasm, inside the nucleus. Those components, the cytoplasmic extensions, and the basket projection that is facing the nucleoplasm, those are not symmetrical. Moving along, how do we know that that's the case, that, that that's the way the nuclear pore complex looks like? Well, again, we have electron microscopy images that actually show that in beautiful detail. So this is the way the nuclear pore complex looks like when you look at it from the top. So here you're looking down into the nuclear pore complex and you're standing on the cytoplasmic side of the nuclear pore complex. And when you look down into that channel, you see that, that there are like fingers that are projecting toward you, and then there is the basket at the bottom. When you look at it from the bottom, this is what you see. You see a basket. The basket is right in front of you, and the basket is actually preventing you from being able to see the extensions that are located at the other end of the nuclear pore complex. So because of these images, these beautiful images that have been captured by electron microscopy, we know exactly that this figure represents in a very close to reality way the structure of the nuclear pore complex. Okay, now in terms of the composition of the nuclear pore complex, there have been a lot of different studies that have addressed how many different proteins are located in the nuclear pore complex. And initially it was believed, it was thought that a large structure such as the nuclear pore complex should have probably hundreds of different proteins. 
Well, after doing very well executed analysis of the composition of the nuclear pore complex, it was determined that there are only about 30 different proteins, 30, 30 different proteins in the nuclear pore complex. The reason for these 30 proteins being able to form that large structure is that each one of them forms one of those eight different structures. So it's one structure that is repeated eight times. And each one of those eight structures contains only 30 different proteins. This is one of those structures. This will be another one. And there will be another six more that are located in radial symmetry around the, the middle of this structure. So only 30 different proteins. Now, the proteins that are structural components of the nuclear pore complex are known as nucleoporins. Nucleoporins. That is proteins of the nuclear pore complex. The name is important. And since they are nucleoporins, they are also referred to as NUPs. N-U-P. NUPs. Nucleoporins or NUPs. And you can see the names of many of them in this particular scheme. You see it right in the middle, toward the middle of the channel, NOP62, NOP58, NOP54, NOP45, and so forth. One important feature, characteristic, of all of these nucleoporins, particularly the ones that are facing the center of this aqueous channel, is that they contain repeats of two amino acids, phenylalanine and glycine. So they have FG, 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 repeated many, many times in their sequence. So those are the so-called FG repeats. So nucleoporins have FG repeats in their structure. And this is important because this is what provides the nuclear pore complex with selectivity. Those FG repeats are disorganized in shape. So these are proteins that don't have a very well-defined shape, and therefore what they produce is kind of a spaghetti-like environment toward the middle of the aqueous channel that is formed by the nuclear pore complex. Okay, so summarizing, the nuclear pore complex is an aqueous channel that communicates the cytoplasm and the nucleoplasm. It is composed of around 30 proteins that are known as nucleoporins or NOPs, and each pore is a cylindrical channel that is attached to a nuclear envelope. There are about 3,000 to 4,000 pores per nucleus, and the transport across the nuclear pore complex is selective. And it is selective both for nucleic acids as well as for proteins that are larger than about 40,000 daltons in molecular weight. And this is important because it defines an important property of the nuclear pore complex, and that is the ability to select what will go through the nuclear pore complex. Now, how is the nucleus formed? The nucleus is a structure that is present in the cell only during interphase. When the cell divides, when the cell goes into mitosis, the nucleus actually disappears. And these are images of cells that are going into mitosis. And you can clearly see how during prophase, there is a membrane that actually surrounds the area where you have the chromatin, the nucleus. So those blue strands that you see in the middle, that's the DNA, that those are the chromosomes that are being fully packed and they are about to be lined up in the middle of the cell to start cell division. So by prometaphase, now, you don't have a very well-defined nuclear envelope. And by the time that you are arrived to metaphase, the nuclear envelope has disassembled completely. And this is an important feature of mitosis in eukaryotic cells. The nucleus, the nuclear envelope, as such, disappears during mitosis. So the question is, how is this happening? And this is another representation of the same idea. You have here first the nucleus, then you go into mitosis, and during mitosis, the nucleus ceases to exist as an organelle. It actually disappears. But once the cell has gone through mitosis, the nucleus becomes visible again. It forms again. So the question is, how is this happening? So this is, this is the structure that we start with. This is this representation of what we had talked about before. This is the, the nucleus and the structure that you see in pink 
is the nuclear lamina. So the nuclear lamina is providing support to the nuclear envelope. And the first thing that happens in mitosis is that the nuclear lamina is disassembled. Now, you might be wondering, how is that disassembled? The answer is very simple, phosphorylation. You phosphorylate the lamines, and phosphorylation of the lamines takes the lamines away. Basically, it disassembles that cytoskeletal structure that is made of lamines. So the lamines remain, the lamines are not being degraded, but the ability to form that scaffold is actually taken away by phosphorylation. So phosphorylation dis disrupts the head to tail structures that were keeping the nuclear lamina intact. Once the nuclear lamina is eliminated or depolymerized, then the nuclear envelope starts bubbling up. And when that happens, basically it forms little vesicles that then get distributed throughout the cytoplasm. So at the end, during mitosis, what happens is that the nuclear envelope forms little vesicles that get distributed throughout the cell. Those vesicles that were facing the inside of the nucleus, those vesicles will contain proteins that were specific of the inner nuclear membrane. And those proteins are represented by the little lines that you see there in the drawing. So this is another representation of the same phenomenon. So here you have your nuclear envelope, you have your nuclear lamina, and then you go into mitosis. And when you go into mitosis, the membrane that formed the nuclear envelope forms little vesicles. And those vesicles are shown there as little balls. And the sticks that are associated to, that, to those vesicles are the lamines. And the lamines are still attached to those vesicles because the lamines are associated to the proteins that are specific of the inner nuclear membrane. Moving along, so as you move through mitosis, as the cell divides, you have now chromatin in cross, close proximity to those vesicles. And there is something important that I had forgotten to mention. The lamines, the proteins that form the nuclear lamina, those proteins have the ability to bind to DNA. So now you have vesicles that have proteins that are specific of the inner nuclear membrane, and those proteins associate to lamines, and those lamine molecules are able to bind to chromatin, to DNA. Because of that, because of that ability of lamines to associate to DNA, the DNA will start to get coated by those vesicles. The vesicles will start surrounding the DNA, and then at some point, those vesicles will fuse. Vesicle fusion. And when those vesicles fuse, they form a larger membrane that now is going to be coating the DNA, the chromosomes. And at first, every chromosome will be independently grabbed by these membranes, but over time, those vesicles, those membranes that are coding every individual chromosome will also fuse together. And when they fuse together, they reform the nucleus of the cell. So at the end of the process, what you have is vesicle fusion that then is able to reform the nucleus that was fully disassembled during mitosis. So how is the nucleus formed? it is formed by the process of vesicle fusion. Which vesicles? The vesicles that were produced when the nuclear envelope was disintegrated during mitosis. And in the whole process, the key players of the whole process are the lamines. Now, at this stage of the cell cycle, the lamines are not phosphorylated. And by not being phosphorylated, they are able to form the polymers that form that supporting structure, that scaffolding structure, that gives shape to a nuclear envelope. Okay, so that's, that's how the nucleus is made, how it is disassembled and how it is put together. And that's what happens during mitosis. But the nucleus during interphase looks different. I mean, that's the time when you basically see the nucleus as such. But within the nucleus, you are actually able to distinguish several different compartments. Now, these compartments are not, they are not isolated from each other by membranes. They are not. There is only one membrane within the nucleus, and that is the nuclear envelope. There are no other membranes within the nucleus. So these little subdomains, subcompartments that we're going to be talking about within the nucleus are visible simply because they are characterized by having specific proteins associated to them. Okay, 
So there will be four different subdomains that we will be talking about in the nucleus. The first one is replication factories. So replication factories are simply the places where DNA replication takes place. So DNA replication does not take place all over the nucleus in a disorganized fashion. No, it actually happens in very specific regions within the nucleus. There are only about 30,000 different origins of replication in the whole genome. However, even though you have 30,000 possible sites where you can start DNA replication, whenever you look at a cell that is replicating the DNA, you can only see about 200 different sites where replication actually takes place. Each one of those little areas where DNA replication takes place is referred to as a replication factory. And replication factories are places where you accumulate all the different factors that are required for DNA replication. And you can easily think of some of those proteins that are required for DNA replication, such as DNA polymerase, helicases, primase, PCNA, the sliding clamp protein, the clamp loading protein. All of those proteins will be substantially enhanced in concentration, concentrated, like basically recruited and kept in very specific places. And those places are the replication factories. Now, the second subdomain that you can actually find within the nucleus is what we refer to as nuclear speckles. Nuclear speckles are places where you actually accumulate the machinery that is required for splicing. So cells that are very active from the point of view of transcription are going to have a good number of nuclear speckles. And in the nucleus, in the nucleus of an active cell, you have about 20 to 50 nuclear speckles. And the idea here, you can start seeing a theme here. The idea is that you need to have all of those factors at hand. You have to put them in an organized place where they will be readily accessible so that they can be easily used whenever there is a need for using them. And you can think of the process of splicing as something that will be needed at a very specific time. So having all of those components that are required for splicing in a single, very well-defined areas within the nucleus is important in order to enhance the efficiency in which these processes actually take place in the nucleus. Other domains that are also recognizable within the nucleus are the so-called promyelocytic leukemia nuclear bodies. Promyelocytic leukemia nuclear bodies, or PML MBs. I hope you notice how one of the words in the name is leukemia. So this is a region within the nucleus that was first identified in people who had this type of cancer, leukemias. Back then, when this domain was identified, it was observed that cells from individuals who had this type of leukemia had fragmented this particular region of the nucleus was fragmented, was not intact. And it was actually shown that if the cancer was treated, and there is a very easy and straightforward treatment for this cancer, promyelocytic leukemia can be treated by giving to the patient transretinoic acid. So when you treat patients that have promyelocytic leukemia with transretinoic acid, these specific regions within the nucleus, that they form again, they show up in the nucleus again. So the appearance of these structures within the nucleus is associated with remission from the cancer. Now, what is the role of this domain? This domain, the promyelocytic leukemia nuclear bodies, is believed to play the role of acting as a storage depot for numerous transcription factors within the cell. So remember, transcription factors, they need to be also mobilize within the nucleus very, very efficiently. So transcription factors are accumulated or stored in promyelocytic leukemia nuclear bodies. And that's the role of these structures. Now, something important about these structures is that proteins that go there, proteins that go to these promyelocytic leukemia nuclear bodies, usually have been modified post-translationally by simulation. 
So most of the proteins that go here have been simulated, and after being simulated, they are targeted to these promulgated leukemia nuclear bodies. Okay, and the final domain that, we, that I want to talk about is the nucleolus. Out of all the different subdomains in the nucleus that I have talked so far, the nucleolus is the only one, the only one, that can be seen directly by microscopy without using any particular type of dyes or staining methods. The nucleolus, or nucleoli, if there are more than one, um, can be seen directly under the microscope. And here, in this particular image, I have actually magnified one of those structures. And in fact, these structures are so dense and so refractory when you look at them under the microscope that sometimes they actually look like little faces within the nucleus. So here I'm actually showing you the way the nucleolus, actually nucleoli, because it's many of them, look like. They kind of give personality to the cell when you look at them under the microscope. And here, in specifically in this image, I am showing you a happy cell. The eyes and the mouth and the ears that you see in this image, they are all nucleoli. Okay, so the nucleolus is therefore the most prominent nuclear substructure. And importantly, the nucleolus is the site of ribosomal RNA processing. And it's also a place in the nucleus where ribosomes are assembled. And something very important is that all copies of the ribosomal RNA genes are in fact clustered within these structures, nucleoli. Now, something additional about nucleoli is that they get dispersed and they need to reform after every cell division. So during mitosis, these structures disappear completely from the nucleus. Well, the nucleus disappears as a whole, so obviously, the nucleoli also disappear. But soon after mitosis, the nucleoli start forming. And early after mitosis, you have many nucleoli within the cell. But as the cell progresses in the cell cycle, those nucleoli start fusing with each other until when they form a big single nucleolus. Now, the small regions within the nucleus where nucleoli get organized are the so-called nucleolar organizing regions. Okay, and with that, you have guessed. We have reached the end. It was a long video, I know, and it was very dense, but I hope that you will watch it as many times as you need.